All right, well, I think we can probably go ahead and get started. Um, seems like we'll be a pretty small group today, which is totally fine. Uh, we, I guess we can go around and introduce ourselves quickly and um, kind of just say how much background we have with both the biology side of it and then also the our computational side. And that way as a group, we can decide kind of which stuff to focus on more. Um, so I'm Allison Smither. I'm a uh, postdoctoral researcher at the University of Texas Medical Branch. Um, so I'm located south of Houston, Texas. Um, I do disease ecology work. So I do like viral surveillance and um, animal studies to look at like the animal human interface for viral diseases. And my, so I'm very comfortable with all the biology presented with this. I just, and I started using R about a year ago. Like I did my whole dissertation, like learned R and did all my dissertation prep in like a couple of months, which was a very strong crash course, but I, I really like using R. So I really want to be able to understand how to do these analyses and whatnot in R. So that's why I was wanting to do this report. So that's a little bit about me. Um, anyone want to volunteer to go next? Yeah, sure. Um, so I've studied biology and then biostatistics, and then I ended up working as a data analyst. Um, but that wasn't for me. So I decided to go back to university and then I studied animal behavior. And now I just started doing a PhD in chicken genetics with a focus on bone health and behavior. Uh, <laughs> so I have used some R, but in a very different field. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How do you pronounce your first name? Doortje. It's a Dutch name. Doortje. Doortje. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> cool. I can go next. Um, my name is Daphne. Uh, I'm in, based in Boston. Um, I work for a digital pathology company. Um, so a lot of the data analysis we do is looking at like spatial relationships of proteins um, and like density of proteins and um, that kind of thing. Um, I write a lot of tools for my company to do these kinds of analysis. So um, uh, yeah, this past year I've developed um, a package and then assisted with um, uh, maintaining and building building up other packages. Um, and I'm pretty familiar with, um, well, yeah, I could do, I could use the refresher on, I guess, uh, genetics, but um, but I'm pretty new to um, doing computational genetics in R. So I'm looking forward to like learning new tools, um, like what's sort of like the um, industry standard for how to do certain processes and things like that. Um, okay, I'm Anna Lee. I'm a PhD student at UCL in London. Uh, I primarily study RNA binding proteins and RNA splicing. Um, and so I'm, I'm fairly familiar-ish with doing, um, working with genomic ranges and stuff in R, um, but I'm, I'm, I guess I'm really interested in like at the multi-omics analysis bit near the end. Um, and then also it's just nice to reread things because um, like, you know, you learn one way to do it, but maybe it's like a janky way that isn't actually very good, so. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, um, well, good deal. So it seems like we've all got a bit, like no one's starting here from scratch on biology, which is kind of what the first chapter is um, leaning, like introducing. So I, I imagine we'll go through that pretty quickly today. And I made like a very broad introduction based off that. So I don't know how much of that will, I don't know how much time we need to spend on that, but to go through in terms of like the pace that we want to do this book club and the areas that we want to focus on I'm going to switch to sharing my screen and we can like go through roughly the um the chapters and like things that we want to like highlight and things we want to kind of more breeze through like I know Annalie you just said the multi-level omics towards the end thank you for what I got to share my screen Where you'd think after using Zoom, how many years and you're still the same? All right, here we go. 
All right, so um, of the 11 chapters of the book, so today we're primarily supposed to do just like an intro to genomics and that corresponds to the first chapter of the book. Um, the next, um, next chapter in the introduction are for genomic data analysis. This is, I think, more just getting into like how to physically use R in general. Um, the third main, the statistical analysis. I would like to spend some time on this, just refreshing it. Like the way that I've done it in the past, again, like I'm not sure is like the correct way to do it. Um, and again, like the data modeling um, chapters four and five for the supervised and unsupervised learning. Um, chapter six seems to be more um, of the, like how to actually like manipulate like FASTA files and um, the raw data in R and how to actually start looking at the data itself. Um, switching back to the general overview, I think it's a little easier to read. Chapter seven, um, getting the sequencing reads and like actually like putting things together. And then the later chapters eight through 11 are going through the different, the four different types of analyses that can be done with it. And I would be particularly interested in like the RNA-seq. Um, I don't primarily, I don't do that much human or like animal sequencing. I'm primarily doing viral sequencing. Um, or I should say I'm learning how to do viral sequencing. That's part of my task. For this month. So uh, those are the chapters that interest me the most would be kind of more the middle chunk. Um, but I'm curious as to what everyone else's thoughts are in terms of what they want to get out of this the most. Or, you know, is it something we just want to like just plow through the whole thing and just get as far as we can every week? I mean, at least myself looking at like the first chapter, I don't know. I, I, I don't want to say we can kind of skim it, but it feels like we can probably skim it. Yeah. And then that's also true for the second chapter a lot. Um, yeah. Just looking at, so, oh my gosh. Like at least for the second chapter, if you look over the exercises, I don't know, maybe I'm speaking too much, but it's stuff like, like some two and three using the plus operator. Like I, I feel, I feel good about our ability to do that. Yeah, yeah. Like I don't, I don't think any of us here are starting like completely at zero for yeah. this. Um, yeah, and good. No, I was just gonna say. So I wonder. Oh my gosh. Also, I can stop sharing. Um, so when I've done like these book clubs before, what we have, what we had done and some of them is basically you go through like spending, depending on the chapter, spending like 20, 30 minutes on the material and then actually just going through the exercises at the end of chapters together and discussing that. So that, that at least worked really well for me because I'm, I have the attention span of a gnat. Um, and so like lots of talking at me makes me a bit distracted. Um, but yeah, that's I, just, yeah, go ahead. I think that sounds good. This is my first book club that I've ever done. So I'm also learning as we go in doing this. So if that has worked for you, um, and then once you've done in the past where, you know, you're spending about half the time talking through the material and then the other half the time just physically getting into the code and running things, that sounds good to me. But yeah, I think the first two chapters um feels like it'll go pretty quick I mean potentially to, um well we have uh someone that just joined is it um Fredrika I mean if we want we could just get through the first two chapters today potentially and then um because some of yes. this, yeah, or yeah, and like some of this stuff, like, am I totally comfortable like writing a loop and structuring and using per and all that? No, not really, but that's something I don't think is like the primary point of this particular course. It's more just introducing you to like what it can and can't be done. Um, yeah, that, that's my thought on it. 
Yeah, should we just dive in first chapter? If you want to share a yeah. screen and we'll walk through and we can Sounds point good. out what we think is cool. Interesting. I'm, yep. Yep. I made some real basic slides for today. I didn't know like what the target audience was going to be. So I just made some like very general information on like intro to genomics and like what is a gene? What is DNA? Um, so it's possible we could just breeze through that and just get right into chapter two. All right. Let me start sharing again. All right, so um, first thing I wanted to do is if you look at the chapter, this chapter is basically just introducing you to like what, it, it's an important thing for people because there's, I think us, most of us are coming from biology backgrounds and then doing the computer science and like the programming side of things, but there are also people that really come into it from a programming heavy side and are looking to understand how to apply it to biology. So I think this is an important part to include. Um, so briefly um, going over what DNA is, you know, the building blocks of life. We hear, you know, oh, it's in your DNA. Like this is the physically what it is, you know, the the um, the sugar phosphate backbone of this and then like the actual nucleoside base together that creates a nucleotide. And these pair together, there's four different types, these pair together to actually create um, the genetic code. And then so you know, a gene is a pair of these a unit of these nucleotides all strung together that create a functional RNA sequence. That RNA serves as the intermediate um, messenger for um, the, like translating like what is being encoded in the DNA. We transcribe that to RNA, this intermediate, um, through a process called transcription. Basically your DNA unzips itself and then you have an RNA polymerase that slowly will write, or not slowly, will um, create a code of RNA. This RNA then gets brought out to the cytosol of the protein. So all of the trans, the DNA is all in the nucleus. Um, RNA transcription happens in the nucleus. The That final, that first RNA product then leaves the nucleus and this is happening out in the cytosol of the cell. Um, where it then becomes um, translated into protein. And in this process, I won't go too much into it here, but the building blocks of proteins are encoded in triplicates of, so let me back up, the RNA, you know, is encoded in, you've got the RNA and then the, each amino acid that is used to form part of the protein chain is encoded in a triplicate of RNA. So each triplicate um, encodes for one particular type of amino acid. And these amino acids get built uh, one by one by one. And then that protein then undergoes folding and post translational modification to become a functional protein. And summing all of that together, your human genome essentially is just like the instruction book for life. You've got all of the genes that are tightly compacted into chromosomes, all those chromosomes, you've got multiple chromosomes that all encode different things. Those are all inside the cell. And then based on how those are transcribed and translated and all the modifications that happen to control these processes, that um, all of that collective genetic material is um, the genome. And so when we study genomics, we are just studying the human genome. So that is a, you know, basically an entire degree where the biology tried to sum up in five minutes or less. Um, going into gene regulation. So part of what we can study with transcriptional analyses and like doing this kind of computation with genomics is to uh, better understand um, gene regulation or the outputs of gene regulation. So there's two different ways that gene regulation can occur. You can have it occur at the transcription level. So taking it from DNA to RNA. So this is before it, uh, the transcription itself even occurs. Like is the DNA that is in the genome, is it being presented in a way that will allow for a transcription to even happen or is it being closed off and it can't be accessed by um, the RNA polymerase to be able to initiate transcription. So that's one way of doing it. And then another way of transcriptional modifications are epigenetic modifications, uh, part of the human gene.
you know, you've got this, you can like in, I don't know if y'all can see my mouse or not, but in like this long skinny strand of the unwound DNA, um, that's physical from the chromosome because the chromosomes are just very, very tight compact units of bound uh, chromatin, which is all um, the genetic material just bunched up essentially. And so unwinding a small piece of that, um, the DNA, the genetic material is uh, physically wrapped around these proteins called histones. And so to be able to unwind some of that, you have to loosen the connection essentially between the different histone groups and you're essentially unraveling it. And so some of the way this can be modified is by methylating or acetylating or doing something else to the physical histones that allow it to say like, hey, this part is now being turned on or accessible. Or no, we're going to, with this modification on this protein, we're turning it off. We can't use it right now. So that's one way that transcription can be regulated before it's even transcribed by the RNA polymerase. You can also control transcription after RNA polymerase has made the RNA. So essentially, when you go from DNA to RNA, you're just going, you have one big strand that's made, but not all of that material in that RNA is necessarily going to be translated to protein. So on the left side here, you've got um, something that would happen. You have in your RNA, the parts that are transcribed are called, or translated, excuse me, are exons. And then the introns are parts that essentially what they do is they, um, proteins that are splicing factors, they can link together different versions of exons to create different proteins from the same transcript. So on the left side here, how a gene would normally be created to create a normal cell, a normal protein as part of a healthy functioning cell would be spliced one way where you only have the exons on the ends. And then if you don't have um, that splicing happening and you have an exon that is also supposed, to, but the exon that was supposed to be excluded wasn't included, um, that could create an academic protein. So you can measure, um, we can look at splicing differences through RNA sequencing analysis. Um, so that's one way RNA sequencing, sorry, RNA uh, transcription can be controlled after the RNA is made. And then finally, there's also non-coding RNAs um, that can interact with the RNA sequence itself. Either A, interact with the RNA sequence itself, so like RNA interference, or, um, and then these molecules will physically bind to the RNA, so you kind of have this RNA-RNA complex that um, regulates the expression of the RNA itself. So different from splicing, it's just another RNA. It's another interaction that's happening that prevents translation of a certain type of that RNA. Um, there's also other non-coding RNA, so ribosomal RNA, transfer RNA, there are some cellular processes that are not encoded by proteins, but are actually done by um, types of RNA, but those don't necessarily interact with the, well, they interact with the mRNA, but not in the sense that it's going to regulate its translation. Uh, genetic mutations, so this is, in my opinion, like this is why you do uh, the sequencing analysis, because you wanna be able to study how these genetic mutations are occurring either at the gene level, so in like the level itself of the DNA, uh, for example, um, I found this, I thought this was a clever way to explain, this is from a, like a muscular dystrophy um, website that to explain just genetic uh, mutations to the general public. So instead of looking at a DNA sequence, they just kind of give an example of a, um, a sentence, like, okay, this is how the sentence is supposed to read. And then the different types of mutations are, they just change the letter. So it's the same thing with DNA. So you can have different types of mutations that all of these will affect how the gene is transcribed and ultimately translated. Um, but these are just different types of ways that, that can happen. So you can either have like a misspelling where you would have one nucleotide replaced with another nucleotide. This would um, could potentially, depending on where that mutation occurs, that missense uh, mutation occurs, could change the amino acid that is encoded by it, which could change the protein function. Um, you could have an additional nucleotide inserted, which is the same 
which would ultimately lead to the same result again, depending on where or like how many insertions and how the reading frame would be changed. Because remember that the reading frame is done in groups of three of uh, three RNA uh, nucleotides correspond to one amino acid. Um, and then deletion, same thing, you know, you're deleting it and change the reading frame, duplication or nonsense mutation where it just doesn't, the code is scrambled, doesn't make sense. And then there's also chromosome allele mutation. So this is just on the level of if you unwound a gene and you're looking at just the letters itself and you're not considering the structure of the genetic material. Uh, so chromosome allele mutations are when you have, um, when you're looking at this from the structural sense, when you've got all of the material tightly packed and you've got entire segments of uh, genome essentially that are being deleted or duplicated or, inversion, or inverted. And these can cause um, severe phenotypic um, displays. So an example of uh, this would be like Down syndrome where you have a trisomy, so you have an extra, uh, well, not so much a mutation, but you actually have a duplication. Uh, not so much of this one in the middle where it's like ABC and you have the AB, ABC. It's like you're just creating an entire another copy of that entire um, chromosome. So these things can uh, have very severe effects. Um, and I think the part that is the most important of all this is the sequencing, like why we're here, like why we're looking to do computational genomics. So there's multiple different types of sequencing um, workflows that can be done to look at different types of material, like different changes essentially. So the most basic thing would be a genetic mutation. So, or genomic mutation, like, you know, did the genome change in this one particular spot? Do some people that explain a certain phenotype, do they have a different set of, do they have different nucleotide changes that affect how that allele presents and that causes that phenotype? That's one thing you can look at with uh, genomic mutation. Transcriptional changes, so looking at the amount of genome or gene that is expressed. There are some things in cancer, for example, or an overexpression of a gene um, can be correlated to um, incidents of that cancer or the precancerous state. So being able to look at transcriptional changes in particular genes, something that I'm not really familiar with, a uh, non-coding RNA regulation, uh, again, would be similar to looking to see um, the presence or absence of that there or the quantity of the small non-coding RNAs. And then um, finally looking at how epigenetic modifications affect genome analysis, or not genome analysis, genome um, translation. So that is, um, you'd be looking at chromatin sequencing and looking at the methylation groups of the histones. But regardless of the different type of sequencing workflows, they all kind of follow the same general steps. You at least for um, Illumina sequencing, depending on the platform that you do, you may or may not have to fragment your starting material, but all of them will have an adapter added to either the fragmented genetic material or the full length strain, but this, the adapters are physically what's going to allow um, interaction with the sequencing flow cell and allow for high throughput sequencing to occur. So you got all of your genetic material, you've adapted it so that it can interact with the flow cell and then physically on the flow cell, depending on the type of sequencing that occurs, um, you can either have um, sequencing by synthesis, which is where, so with the fragmented DNA, they make lots and lots of copies. And as each copy is made onto the flow cell, the fluorescent nucleotides are added. And so that's how you can get millions and millions of reads of very small fragments, which are then put together to analyze, or if you do um, long reads like on nanopore sequencing, um, you've got your adapted DNA or RNA, um, you can do both on nanopore to interact. It's adapted so that it can interact with the nanopore flow cells and as it pulls through the electrical pulse um, can, uh, the electrical pulse 
is determined by the ionic current change that as it's the DNA or the RNA is through the nanopore. Um, and then that can be used to determine the sequence itself. So you're not actually sequencing it, but you're just looking at how the ion pulses or the electric electrical current changes with each particular nucleotide. And so it's just read through that. And then after that, you put it all together, make sure all your reads are okay, take off all the adapter sequences that were put on, and then you've got your reads. And then depending on the type of analysis you want to do, you can then take those reads and put them through a whole bunch of different metagenomic pipelines, not metagenomic pipelines, excuse me, um, bioinformatic pipelines to look at different types of analysis. And this is really what in this course we're going to be focusing on is like getting from the quality control part, like getting your reads and getting everything put together and then going through and doing different types of analysis, depending on what you're looking at. So that was um, primarily what I had today. Again, I didn't know how much time to spend on this or like what kind of audience would be going for, but to give a very, very brief crash course on genomics, essentially trying to condense a degree's worth of information in just a few minutes. Um, but I do have some links on the shared group slides. Um, in particular, the two main sequencing platforms. I know there's other platforms like Ion Torrent and Pyro Sequencing that are used, but the two most that I've experienced that the most commonly used are Illumina Sequencing, which is the sequencing by the synthesis, and then the Nanopore Sequencing, which is where you can have long reads by it just like sucks it through a Nanopore and it just um, can detect what nucleotide is present based on its electrical current signature. So I've got some intro videos and that I right now I'm primarily using for learning nanopore sequencing, um, but a lot of my other colleagues use Illumina. Uh, I don't know. Does anyone else have any other experience with other uh, next generation sequencing platforms? There's Pack Bio, which is also long reads, but I don't actually know how they work. Um, yeah, I remember like learning about it, but I I rarely see it used. I at least in my field. Yeah, it's because the. It's expensive um, compared yeah. to, you know, Nanopore, which is pretty dirt cheap uh, or, you know, fairly. Um, yeah, relatively speaking. Yeah, yeah so that was works. everything I had for this chapter. Any questions or we just want to keep going? I, like I said, I, it seems like we all have, I know Daphne, you were saying you've seen more like spatial, like protein spatial. So um, was this enough information to kind of remember, like refresh on the genomics? Yeah, for sure. Um, is it okay if I ask some questions now or should the questions- Yeah, go? absolutely. Okay. Um, so do both of these platforms perform both DNA and RNA sequencing or are there different companies that sort of do diff, uh, like focus more on DNA versus RNA? No, they uh, they both do both. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, it just kind of depends on. So, like, when you do RNA sequencing, you can most of the time you are reverse transcribing. So you're taking the RNA and you're bringing it back to the DNA state. You're creating um, cDNA to be able to transcribe or to be able to use just regular like P, like if you're doing sequencing by synthesis to be able to do that it to be able to get reads, but there are also some technologies. I know it's on Nanopore. I don't know. I'm pretty sure it's on Illumina too, where you can actually directly sequence RNA. Um, so you can, it'll, you just add your adapters directly to the RNA and then you can sequence the RNA itself. Okay. But you can still do RNA sequencing. Most RNA sequencing is done by reverse transcribing the RNA to DNA and then just doing the genetic, like the DNA um, work up on the, on the cDNA. I see. Okay. But yeah. Um, and then like the adapters, can you, can you, um, talk a little bit more about them? Like what are they like DNA sequences that get attached to these fragments or are they like, flor like, um, fluorescence molecules or like what, what, by what mechanism do they like work? Yeah. So the adapters, it depends on, again, it, it all, adapters are all platform specific. So I'm gonna to speak to what I know, which is the Nanopore platform. So the adapter, it's part a sequence, and then it's also 
partly um, like proteins that are attached to it. So you're essentially just prepare it's so it's like part DNA, part protein. It's just kind of what you need to be able to put the um, you know, prepare the genetic material for sequencing. So the nanopore it contains um, that you've got the motor protein on there, which is actually what interacts with the nanopore itself. And so that's what's going to control how the RNA or the DNA like physically goes through the pore. And then it's also got some sequences that allow for um, to prevent the material from getting like translated back to protein before it gets on the nanopore because it's still kind of um, the enzymes for all that are there. And then there's also a sequence that allows it to interact with, um, it's called a tether. So it's literally like a little hook or like a, a, like it's a hook sequence that allows it, the tether that is put onto the flow cell to hook onto the, the, the motor protein. And so that way it all kind of sticks together. And then a, a terrible example with my hand, but then like drawing it through doing that. For the Illumina adapters, um, the Illumina platform is a little bit different. It's got, um, um, that's what I describe it. It's got a bunch of little sequences that you have to be able to that are like specific to the, the flow cell that you have to be able to put on to your fragmented DNA. So that way it can bind to that little part. And so that way, instead of having the tether like the nanopore does, it it binds it by um, a complementary sequence. So you're adapting it to be able for it to be able to recognize that sequence in the flow cell. Um, so that way it's got a complementary place to bind and it can stay and that way it can amplify through that. Um, I don't know, Emily. Do you have any more experience with the Illumina? Oh man, I'm a biomedician. I don't touch. I don't do the pipetting I thing. I I never extracted <laughs> RNA in my life. Oh yeah, yeah. I, uh, so uh, so the only thing that I think is important from a bioinformatic point of view to think about with adapters, unless you get into the nitty gritty, is that like something that happens sometimes is um, something called internal priming, which is typically so. If you look in that little B square there. You see how like most mature RNAs end up with a bunch of A's at the end. So a lot of sequencing um, technologies, what they do to enrich for mature RNAs, ma mature RNAs, is they use a, what a, like a poly D, poly, uh, a poly T adapter. So that's just a bunch of T's because T's bind with A's, and so that'll pull it down. So the only thing yeah. to like be aware of, like from bioinformatics point of view, is that sometimes just in in a genome, you might have a bunch of T's. So you might think you're pulling down a mature RNA and the end of a mature RNA, but actually you're pulling down some random like intronic nonsense that you don't give a crap about. Like that's the only thing that I am aware of with adapters. And yeah. I think they do some steps to try and stop it with most standard like full length Illumina sequencing. Um, but I know it can be a problem with some Oxford. And then there's, there's another type of sequencing, which is just to look at the poly A tail called um, QuantSeq, which has this problem quite a bit. Um, I, I got, I, I, I know so many different sequencing things. I was like, oh, they didn't wrench in my favorite. Oh. Oh no, do you want to add anything to this? Like I had literally like, <coughs> excuse me. Like my uh, task this month is like to figure out how our nanopore sequencer in our lab works and then like to start doing viral sequencing. So I'm like definitely learning as I go with this, so. I don't know, there's just um, millions of sequencing types. And like one thing, I guess this is just a nerdy cause I, I'm an RNA biologist. <laughs> um, with post-transcriptional regulation, there's also modifications that can happen on the RNA itself. And that's the cool thing you can look at with nanopore that I think is, a lot of people use. So like, in addition to having like a methylation signal on, on DNA, you can also have methylated RNA, which is, it's, is another form of post-transcriptional regulation, but that's, and aside, there's lots of yeah, things yeah. that happen. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And then one last thing I want to add on like the adapter ligation too. Um, so you can sequence, most of the time, you can sequence more than one sample at a time. And so you also need to add something called a barcode to those fragments. And that way you can, this would, you, you do this before you add the adapters, but the barcode essentially allows you to identify, hey, this is only from this one sample. This is from another sample. So each sample gets treated with a, its own unique barcode. 
And that way all the fragments associated with that sample are all labeled with one barcode. So you'll have your adapters put on, you have, so you've got fragment and then you've got your, if you're barcoding, you have a barcoded sequence and then you've got your adapter sequence there. And then that is the entirety of the thing that will then be put onto the flow cell, which then gets sequenced. Yeah, so that's what, that's what I got. <laughs> Daphne, do you have any other questions on it? <laughs> I'm definitely going to be using your resources and going through them. <laughs> That's for sure. Um, I I linked um, so the Khan Academy ones that like you can go as like in depth or you, or as just like general as you want. But I I really like their stuff in terms of just like explaining all the individual processes. Like I I'm a field person. I don't really I I haven't done any molecular assays. Like looking at probably would be like have done. Um, in a very long time. So some of that is like really good to refresh on, especially for like how these certain proteins do this, this, and this. And like, I conceptually understand it, but if I need the detail, it's a good place to go. And then the genome.gov has just a bunch of really good resources. Um, and then, yeah, those, um, the Illumina platform and the Nanopore platform, all, they all put out great videos, um, understand, like to show the technology and then just kind of go like a step-by-step -step of how they would do some analyses. So I would I would definitely include in these the resources that they mention in the resources in 1.5 because they actually mentioned what I think are like some of the most I mean obviously integral things like ever like I have most of these tabs open right now so IGV I literally always have that open on my computer because mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I I look at sequencing data all the time um, so it's 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 really, really useful. UCSC is also super duper useful. Um, Ensemble, I'm constantly on Ensemble as well. So that's like, but this is of course, cause I, I, th I think a lot, I mean, I'm fortunate because I'm, I'm doing the easy thing, which is I'm working with human data, which is so much easier. Um, cause there's more annotations for it. Um, and then the other thing that I think is like kind of, if you scroll up a tiny bit, I think is useful to mention that a tiny bit more. Keep going, keep going, keep going. Wait, am I at the wrong spot? Wait, wait, where is it? Sorry. Uh, oh no, it was it was down. It was down. Sorry. Oh okay. okay. <laughs> um, so, geo and ENA. Um, so both of these I I use oh, okay. quite frequently. Um, as well. So ENA is really cool because anytime anybody in the world does RNA sequencing and they publish a paper, uh, most journals require that they upload it to somewhere public, public. So you can download pretty much all of RNA seq that anybody has ever done from this website. Um, and I just think that's very useful. And then ENCODE and TCGA are also super useful. Um, oh, and then one they haven't mentioned that I think is just really useful is proteinatlas.org. Um, I use this a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, Ooh, so this, okay. this, this is really cool. Uh, pick, pick EGFR if you want. That's a nice little cancer gene. Um, so you can okay. see like, yeah. So it shows you like a lot of really useful stuff. And this is helpful if you study humans. So I, I, or kind of maybe mice, you can guess. Uh, apologies for the, for the plant chicken people. <laughs> 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 but they do have, there's lots of probably resources for chicken actually. Um, uh, so you can click on like subcellular location, for example, um, or like if it's expressed in brain tissue, um, like, so if you click on the right hand side where it says subcell, it'll show you like imaging of like where this protein has been found to be. Um, and just, I think this is a super useful oh. thing. And then it'll also, oh, wow. if you scroll down a little bit more, it should show you some assays. And then they've done it in a few different, it depends on the gene, but they've done stuff in like other cell lines and human cell lines, um, shows you RNA expression across. Um, yeah, if you scroll, yeah, you can basically see like in different cell lines, you can toggle stuff like this. Um, I think this is a really useful resource um, if you study like, again, yeah. Yeah, that's uh, really just, cool. 
Yeah. There, and there's, there's just, oh yeah, there's antibodies too. If you're looking for like on the left-hand side. So if you're like, oh, I have this weird gene that came up in my analysis, what antibodies go against it? It's just super duper useful. Um, and you could spend days clicking around on your genes of interest for it. Oh yeah. And this is uh, all just like compiled from published data. Golly, I think there is a, like people are being paid to maintain this website. I, okay. I don't know exactly who, who runs it. I never looked into it. Yeah. Um, it's, I guess, oh, of course it's, 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 um, it's the, it's uh, Karolinska, I guess. Looks like it's the Europeans. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, gotcha. this, is, this is great. I highly recommend clicking around it. Um, that, that should also be a resource in there, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. I've never heard of that before. Super cool. Super cool. Um, yeah. I didn't want to, I, I deliberately left this one out. It was like, oh, we'll probably like cover this in our later chapters. But yeah, this is a good put. Like, I, the UCSC browser, um, they do have chicken data in this. Um, and they've got other like common animals. Um, so if you go to genome browser, um, you should be able to, or no, you go to genome, sorry. Um, they've got, you can see genomes for all these different types of species that they've gotten. They, you know, primarily, mammals, but they do have other ones too. Um, what do we got? Chicken? Yeah, so they've got um, the chicken genome up here and so you can, you can download all of the um, annotation data. So this is like your reference genome that you'd be able to use for any um, computational things. You'd have all of that there. Um, for this and species that, you know, there's a bunch of different like human um, assemblies you can do. So you can look at the different like assemblies that they've been doing over time. If we go back down to the chicken, um, they've got a couple different assemblies too. The, the newer ones are going to be, you know, more detailed than they were at the beginning. But if you were going back and looking at old data and you wanted to compare that data to like a data that was known at the time, you could also choose that. Um, assembly for it. So this is really useful for, um, yeah, just having like for reference genomes for animals, not so much so viruses, they just have Ebola and SARS-CoV-2, um, but there's also a lot of viral sequencing data on there. Um, they've got everything from, they've got proteins, not proteins, um, Saccharomyces cerevisiae to um, some worms, they've got uh, fruit fly ones, they've got fish, they've got um, reptiles and frogs, they've got, and then primarily mammal species. Um, I do a lot with um, rats and bats, and so they have some species, but they don't have all the species that I work with, and so that's, um, I don't, I think they're very slowly, there have been projects that are working to get more reference genomes for more um, for like just species diversity, but um, they're not readily available yet. But this is always a really good place to start. Yeah. All right. Uh, anything else for chapter one? Good. Um, all right. So we can get a little bit into chapter two, or we can just wrap it up early for this week. Um, it's up to y'all. Um, I had budgeted for like an hour, but you know, I think this is also a decent stopping point because we only have about 10 minutes left. Yeah, uh, I, I would vote we stop here. Does anyone want to present next week? I can, I can present. Okay. So That'd be I'll great. Chapter two. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah. Can we talk a little bit about like the logistics of this group? Like, do I need to be updating like a website or something like that? Or like what, what's the deal? Yes. Um, I should have probably gone into that sooner. So there, if you are on the Slack channel, 
at the top here, um, there's a um, a Google file that we can like fill. You know, whoever wants to claim one can pick uh, fill in the dates they want to do. And also, if there are now, if we want, we can decide like, hey, we're not going to meet on this date. We can also discuss some of that now as well. Um, like, for example, I think one of them is the day after. Well, not really. Shouldn't. Like the day after Thanksgiving um, in the U.S., I think I'm, uh, that's the 25th. That's uh, typically a holiday day. So, you know, consider um, pushing that one to another week and we can move things around accordingly. Um, so yeah, that's that's how you sign up for it. And then the the shared slides of the what I had presented and what I had done is from this link. And so this is what we'll physically update. And to do that, if you go to the um, the, the GitHub repo, this is what took me the longest. Honestly, it was like I had never done Git before, and this was um, and like I had to re-update all of my R files and then like I lost my packages. <laughs> I had to go back and find them, but it, it, I got it worked out. Um, but this the book club page is the um, the comp genome page, and they've got really detailed instructions here on the bottom of how to present. So the what took if you the so the GitHub locally, and then I use the the GitHub, this happy git and the git of the R user. Um, this was super, super helpful, like very, very clear instructions, um, walking you through step by step of how to create a GitHub profile. Um, I, I don't know, are you familiar with GitHub already or have you used Git before? Okay. Yeah, so getting Git and then getting it installed and then also um, getting connecting our studio to GitHub. Um, so walking through here, if you can get through step or chapter 12, um, you'll be able to get it linked up your um, GitHub with RStudio. And then from there, once you've gotten, you can get get an RStudio to talk to each other, um, then going to um, install these packages and then set up. I didn't, I just did default directory. I didn't do this, but I, got the, um, to use this directory, I did this, restarted this, and then um, typing this line in, will physically create a copy on your computer of all of this information. Um, and then from there, you can, for your chapter, and I'll open up my R studio for this. Um, if you go to the files, once you've got your copy on there, you can click on, so the next chapter would be the chapter two. And then you can start editing through the R markdown file on here. Okay. Uh, yeah, and then um, build the book and then commit this. The I guess the moderator for the Slack channel, John Harmon, who's super, super nice, he, um, you'll commit and then push the changes and then um, he'll work with you to, any changes that need to be made, he'll either make them or just like talk with you before making them. And then it gets merged together and then it all gets put up. But the instructions are on the bottom of the page. Um, and yeah, just getting the, the GitHub for the user, that was like the, the critical part for me. And then the rest of this, um, once it's in our studio, you just need to edit your particular chapter and then you push it back and then it gets merged and then it's all synced. Okay. Yeah, this was, it just took me like an embarrassing long amount of time to get this fixed. Um, I have like, this is all like for me, for me but um, the instructions they gave were like very straightforward to follow. So um, kudos to them. Deal. Uh, well, anything else? Any other questions from anyone? Good. It's Dorothy. How do you pronounce it? I want to be sure I'm getting it right. Dorothy. Dorothy. Yeah. That's Dorothea. Right. Okay. Got it. Got it. Okay. Sounds good. Um, 
I guess, I, you know, I'll, I don't really, I have a Twitter, but I don't really use it. I guess I can like put out a call and be like, hey, if anyone wants to join, because in theory, these groups are open to anyone any week and sort of thing. So, um, but if not, do we want to kind of just rotate through the um, presentations? Yeah. Cool. Um, that sounds good to me. Uh, well, thank you guys for uh, learning alongside me. I, like this is, like I said, the first time I've been doing, I've done at a, done a book club or really done or marked down did any of this. So um, it was a good learning exercise for me and I'm looking forward to actually getting into the book and not just the um, starter material. Yep. So um, Daphne, you'll, you've got next week, you said? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, and I think we're good. So I will um, see you all next week then. Okay. Bye. 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 Yes. Bye.